So ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. Uh, so Neocropolis is a school of philosophy, we say in the classical manner. It's a search for wisdom in a practical manner. I think the most important emphasis at Neocropolis is that it's practical. It applies to our day-to-day -day lives and it adds meaning and purpose to our lives. And in order to kind of make ourselves better people and also to make the world a slightly better place, Culture is an extremely transformative, it has an extremely transformative property. Um, so we started the culture circle to celebrate culture as a very, with a philosophical lens. So culture as a search for f meaning, for purpose, for beauty, for truth. A very warm welcome as you can hear to Priya. Priya, please, please do join us. Thank you very, very much. A very, very warm welcome to Priya. What can I say? She's worked in Odyssey and in dance for 18 years. She studied with the likes of um, Daksha Mashruwala in Bombay, Sujata Mahapatra in, or in Orissa, and many, many others. And she studied with Jhelum for the past six years. And we are really very grateful Thank to you, Priya. So over to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So I'd just like to first thank all of you for inviting me here. It's really an honor and I'm very humbled because I've actually never been to a venue where people are like genuine, um, you know, art lovers and interested genuinely in what they're going to see and also the level of um, love and welcome, warm welcome that I've received over here. Um, I would describe myself as someone who's just a lover of the arts and of dance. Ever since I was a child, I was just uh, mesmerized by dance and dance sculptures. And um, I never knew that the sculptures which I saw in temples were actually there in, da in a dance style. Um, and my journey in dance began only when I was 24 years old, after my college. And ever since then, I practice, I study, I don't perform too much. But um, I spend a lot of time reading and studying and trying to go deeper into the art. And as you know, all the arts are connected. So it's not just one. You have to be into everything. So I'm going to talk about my favorite topic today, which is dance and the dance style that I practice, which is Odissi. So when I spoke to Zarina, she told me that most of you are studying philosophy and want to understand dance in a spiritual, philosophical, yogic kind of aspect. And I think a lot of you may have already heard Mandakini Trivedi's um, talk because she is actually the best to talk about the yogic aspect of our classical dances. So as you know, all these dances have come from Shastric texts, which themselves are very yogic in nature. And when you dance, you are actually disciplining yourself, your form from the out. And the moment you systemize and discipline your outer body, because it's cleaned up, your, it starts disciplining inward and your energy is able to rise higher. And you're able to, as your energy rises higher, you become more sensitive. You're able to feel things to a much larger degree and you're able to connect. <coughs> The biggest human problem is that we feel we are alone and that's when our ego is very high. It's not our fault, the ego is meant to protect us. It was meant for you to be aware of yourself, to protect yourself. But at the same time, you feel it's just me in my body. And the moment you're able to move out of your body and feel everything else around you, um, you connect to a much larger reality which is beyond yourself. And when you do that, the first thing that drops is your fear. And this is the hardest thing for everyone, not to fear existing. And if you can feel that I am more than just this existence, then you are living your highest reality and your highest truth because you are unlimited then by any thought process, any feeling. So this is a very far-fetched thought, but uh, as an artist and as people who, uh, you know, relate to the art and are involved with the arts, there will be times in your life where you forget yourself and you forget your body 
and you forget where you are and you're somewhere else. And that's the feeling of just being disconnected and being connected to everything else, to this larger universe. Um, so that is the kind of yogic aspect of dance when a dancer is performing. Uh, when we are performing, we are creating a picture for you that is like a grid. It's very clean, it's very neat, it's very balanced, it's harmony. Apart from creating that physical picture, we are telling you a story that has a deeper meaning in it, that has a higher truth in it. So you're connecting on a physical level, you're connecting on a mental level, and you're also listening to the music, which is again harmony, rhythm, melody, and you're listening to the language, which will be like a very classicized language, like Sanskrit. So automatically, like you hear music, why do you say when I hear this music, I feel soothed, I feel relaxed? Why? Because that music is activating a certain energy in your body. Or you see like a really beautiful painting, or you see a really beautiful scene and you say, I feel, I felt so good seeing that. So it's basically the art is to activate certain energy centers within the audience's body and help their awareness heighten through the awareness of the art, the instrument, whatever you want to call it, music, dance, literature, poetry, whatever it is. Now, how is dance or any live art different from a movie? Okay, in a movie, it's amazing today. You have special effects, 3D, this, that. So, like, can I ask you? Huh? Like, how is it different? Exactly. So, when you're performing live, the person who's actually performing is going through that emotion at that particular point or that movement at that particular point. And when you are witnessing it, you are partaking in it. You're sharing that energy. So that's how that experience is totally different from watching a movie or anything with all the special effects and everything else in it. Um, and other than that, uh, in classical arts, we have a lot of symbolism. So if I show this, I'm showing a woman. Now the audience who are used to seeing it, I'm just doing this, okay? The audience who are used to seeing it are filling the space of that woman. I am just showing the gesture and with my expression and the hand, a beautiful woman, you are filling in the other half by seeing that beautiful woman who I'm just showing to you with a symbol. So that's how you are also partaking in the creative energy of what is being presented. So now let's get to Odyssey. Odyssey, as you may or may not know, is a very recent dance. It didn't exist hundreds of years ago. It was actually reconstructed in the 1950s by some dance gurus. And it was reconstructed from whichever dances were existing in Orissa. And there were some Shastric texts. And as you know, Orissa's temples are replete with um, dance sculptures. Alongside the tribal presence, there's so there's the tribal people and then there are all the people who have migrated to Orissa over the years and the different traditions. You have a long history of Buddhism, Jainism, Shaivism, Tantrism and finally the Vaishnava cult of Jagannath. So the Jagannath temple was built in the 12th, 13th century. So they had, they used to offer the gods, like today in Hindu temples they used to offer them food. They would offer them entertainment. So in the morning, when the gods needed to be woken up, they used to have special singers who used to go into the sanctum of the gods and they used to sing morning songs to waken the god. Then in the afternoon when the god was having his lunch, they would have different singers come and sing something entertaining for his lunch time. And then at night to put the gods to sleep, they would have the singers again come into the temple and they would sing songs that were soothing to put the god to sleep. So these were the dancers and the singers which were attached to the temples. So in Orissa, 
these dancers were called maharis which means a woman of a high order or whatever um the temple texts in orissa say that the maharis were originally imported from telangana that's andhra pradesh because they are bordering each other these maharis were just not normal people they had to study, study sanskrit they had to study all the different shastras and they had to be able to sing in sanskrit so what had happened is uh, the maharis mainly used to perform in the night a text called a geet geet govind which was love poems written by jaydev on krishna what had happened is by the 15th century chaitanya mahaprabhu had come to orissa and he had started a different sect of a vaishnava cult parallel and in vesh in the chaitanya mahaprabhu sect it was monastic so he did not believe in women dancing before god because they felt that women were a distraction and it was all men basically in the sect so they started this tradition where they used to dress up little boys because the women used to sing to and why did the why did they have women singing because when you sing you evoke emotion and there's a certain devotion that you want to evoke in devotees right in the people who are coming to the temple so these women so instead of the women they had little boys because up until the age of 12 a boy's uh, voice sounds like a girl's voice so they used to dress these boys up like maharis and they used to make them sing all the songs that were sung in this temple this was the chaitanya mahaprabhu the the ritual that he had started and the boys were called gotipuas also the vaishnava philosophy was that all bhaktas are women and krishna is the man and that's the kind of relationship that the devotees should have to krishna like they are all radha and krishna is the one and only a uh, lover of theirs and that's the reason why in a lot of the love poetry you will you always see or you hear okay um krishna is with this other woman and he is with this other woman and he is with this other woman because life is not partial just to one person life is there for everyone and if not in our relationships with our husbands or our boyfriends but if we get over that feeling that life is just for me then life also becomes a lot easier to live so what had happened is because they were young boys they could do a lot more than just sing and dance at the same time the maharis mainly sang and they showed a few hand gestures like this is krishna this is you this is me radha and we are in you know they used to use these few hand gestures but the boys because they were young they could really move around and sing at the same time they didn't have a separate singer for them so while they were training in the akhadas they also had the martial arts in the akhadas which was mayur ban chao so the kings of orissa used to have their own martial arts army and these people used to be training in the same place as the gotipuas uh the gotipuas performed not only in the temple but during religious festivals they they were gotipua troops who would go around from village to village performing singing the traditional odia songs of radha krishna and performing so in order to make the performance more appealing they introduced acrobatics so at the end of the day there isn't any religion or any temple that doesn't need money so these guys also needed to entertain people and they needed to earn a living so they introduced uh these gymnastics and what is interesting about it is that if you see old temple sculptures in orissa and you see old patachitra paintings which are their local uh, handicraft paintings they do they have all these gymnastic poses in them so it was already there in the culture because there was tantric influence and yogic influence in orissa this was already existing at the time so now we come to what happened to uh, all these old traditional dances so during the 1700s you had a lot of mughal invasions in india and the royalty in orissa 
were th overthrown. The, pa the temple lost its patronage and a lot of the dancers didn't have any uh, means of livelihood. A lot of the Maharis had gone into prostitution, the temple dancers. In 1856, when the British came to India, because they saw a lot of these women um, who were dancing, and the dancers had moved into the courts. So their dance from being in the temple had moved into, that's the only thing they knew. So they were dancing in the courts and a lot of them had gone into prostitution. They needed a patron. So when the British came and they saw these dancers dancing in the courts, they passed this anti-notch movement in 1856. So the Maharis were not allowed to dance at all. If you were caught dancing, you were imprisoned. This is when the Mahari tradition went into a decline. And it was not being followed, it was not being handed down from mother to daughter or whoever was living in that area. Post-independence, there was this urge of people from Orissa, of different parts of India to get back their cultural roots, which they had lost during the British time. So there were dance theatres, there were theatres in Orissa and you know in the old days they have this thing of uh, dance drama. So you have some dialogue and then they suddenly, like a Hindi movie. Why do we have these dance scenes in Hindi movies? Because there's like a, you know, scene going on and suddenly the characters break into music and dance. Because this comes from an old theatre tradition, which were called dance dramas, where um, you had mostly characters dancing with each other and enactment going on and then there were a few dialogues in between. So at this time in Orissa, when these theatres were there, they needed some dance to open the scene, to open the play. In between the scenes, they needed dance. So that's when the old gurus who were Maharis, uh, who were sons of Maharis or were Gotipuas had joined the theatre because they could get some livelihood from there. So that's when they started coming together to create a dance. And that's when they realized that within Urissa, there is classical shastras, there is something that is more that they can make a dance that is classical. So what exactly makes a dance classical? A dance is classical when you have texts that are old, that are about the dance, when you have specific postures, when you have specific hand gestures, um, when you have uh, literature that is Shastric, when you have music that is Shastric, that's when a dance is not just folk dance and it moves into classical dance. Now I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit to you about um, Odyssey and what is our basic language in Odyssey. There are four basic postures in Odyssey dance. The first one is Samabhang. So in Samabhang, my weight is equally balanced on both my feet and my body is straight. Okay, this is one position from where we dance. The next one is Abhang. So now what has happened? I have bent one of my legs and automatically one part of my body to balance the other has moved. So there is more dynamism happening. The third is Tribhang. Tribhang because there are three bends. One, two, three. The head is bent, the torso is bent, and the legs are bent. And if you see, there's three, three bends in each part of my body. My foot, my lower leg, upper leg, wrist, this part of my hand, and here. So this is called Tribhang. And the fourth position is Chauka. Okay, where the weight is again balanced on both the feet. Now, Tribhangi. All my weight is only on my left foot. My right foot is absolutely free. And this is supposedly a very feminine stance. They say this is because of the bends and the curves. They use this in Odyssey and they say that this is the feminine posture. Now chalk, this is opening out more. They say this is a masculine, more manly posture. 
weight is equally distributed between both legs. So we use a combination of these four postures and we create the dance. Now what makes Odissi dance different from other classical styles of dance? The main part of Odissi, if you watch a lot of classical dance, is the torso movement. So we use our torso in different ways, front, back, side, circle. You will see a lot of torso movement being used. So they say that the seat of emotion is here. And when the music is playing and you move this part of your body, automatically you're resounding with emotion. Now, I'm going to show you a, a little bit of what makes, gives Odyssey its um, okay, characteristics. One is opposition. Okay, this is a big uh, part in uh, sculpture as well, where you will see like in certain sculptures, this is, uh, this is one side, this is one side, this is one side. Now what does this do as opposed to just this? When you're in a position like this, you're creating dynamism because my energy is not just in the center. There's some here, there's some here, and there's this very tender balance going on. It's not just in the center. There's some weight here, there's some weight here. Um, that's called opposition. So now I'm going to just show you a little bit of what I mean by opposition in Odyssey. Ta, e, thi, na, ka, he, ni. Okay, where is my neck? Which side? And where is my body? See? One, two. Can you see where my body went and my neck went? Three, four. They are going opposite each other. Okay? Same thing in Trivangi. Ta, e, thi, na, ka, dhi, ni, ta, e, thi, na, ka, dhi, ni. Did you see how they were going opposite? My neck was going here, body there. Neck here, body there. This is the main thing of Odyssey. So the legs are always stable and grounded and the upper body will be in movement. It's like a tree where your trunk is rooted to the ground but on the top there's movement. But that movement is following a particular line. It's not randomly happening. So this is the first thing that you'll notice in Odyssey dance. This quality of opposition. Next thing Okay, one more thing I'm going to ask you. Same, we'll do the same thing. Ta, e, thi, na, ka, dhi, ni. What was the first thing that happened? First I hit my foot. Did my body and my foot move at the same time? If my body and foot moves at the same time, it'll be ta, e, thi, na. Can you feel the difference of that happening at the same time and now me doing it as a delayed reaction? Ta, e, thi, na, ka, thi, ni. Can you feel the difference? So when you do it at the same time, it's like cut and it's done. And when there is a delayed response, to the tala, there's two things going on. There's rhythm and there's melody. The rhythm is very precise, but the melody is flowing. So my foot is following the rhythm, my body is following the melody. Understand? So it's like an echo after something is that echo is still continuing. So this is a speciality of Odyssey dance. In Bharat Tatim, you'll see with the foot, everything is happening simultaneously. And that has a beauty of its own. It's very electrifying. It's very crisp. But Odyssey 
because of the culture and the language everything is round everything is like a wave so that is the what is come from the soil from the land so that has entered the dance so for example if i do 1 2 3 1 2 3 so after my foot my body has come that's what is typical of odissi okay now in odissi we have different foot positions so there are innumerable innumerable amount i'm just going to show you a few so we always start from close and we move outwards open 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 and it gets from simple to complex so we'll start with adhipada samapada viparita mukha pada kumbha pada dhanu pada prushta dhanu pada maha pada prushta maha pada एक पाद मीनपूछ आश्रित लोलित उत्तोलित उल्लोलित जंगाश्रित जानुआश्रित नुपुर सूची कुंचित अनुकुंचित घर्षित विलग्ना पार्शिनी त्रस्य एंड इट गोज ऑन एंड ऑन एंड ऑन ओके so uh, no it's nothing it's just part of our training so and then it gets more complicated you know like ha huh? so uh, yeah these are sanskrit words so like nupur this is jangashrita which is your thigh januashrita which is your calf nupur pada suchi means needle kunchita bent so these now this has all been created by keluchan mahapatra when he saw the sculptures and he saw all these different foot positions so this one meena pucha which is fish tail because it looks like a tail and this ashrita very strange so if you see the sculptures there are girls who are holding like a tree and they are resting their foot on the rock behind them so he is taking it from that and why they are resting on the rock because one part of you is on earth and one part of you is in heaven you know like this is all the meanings behind those sculptures so he took all those foot positions and then and then they get more and more at the end you'll have like this then you'll have bandhani pada which is very common where your this part of your body has to be this way and the front part is facing totally for so the foot positions get more and more complex that's our foot positions then our hand positions so there is one text called the natya shastra which is like a universal text all the dance styles take it and they take whatever they want from it it's not like you have to take everything from that that's the beauty of india is that people synthesize whatever they want and they make it their own so the natya shastra is followed by all the dance styles in whichever extent they want but they also have what you call your regional style your regional texts and they combine this shastric text with their own regional texts so for example in the natya shastra you have what you call hasta mudra which is hand gestures which have meanings so you have pataka त्रिपताक अर्धपताक कर्तरीमुख मयूर अर्धचंद्र आलपद्म फॉर एग्जाम्पल ओके दिस इज इन अभिनय दर्पण नॉट नाच्य शास्त्र सॉरी सो इन उरिस्सा यू हैव अ टेक्स कॉल अभिनय चंद्रिका वे यू विल हैव समथिंग कॉल तांबूल बलय पुष्प डिफरेंट बट लोकली दिस वॉज अ मॉर colloquial hand gesture so they have combined the two now i'll just show you we have uh, hand gestures that are single hand and that are like double hand so i'll just show you a little bit of the single hand gesture and how it's used so if i want to use this to denote a meaning 
what are the different things I can say with this first hand gesture. So, Pataka Hasta Natya Rambhe, the beginning of dance. Vahi Vahe, clouds. Vane, a forest because of the, all the trees going from up to down. Vane, Vastu Nishedane, I don't want. Very clear. Kuchasthale, me. Nishayam cha. Night time. The whole earth is in darkness. Nadhyam. This is a river. Amara mandale. The heaven. Okay? So there's all these things that you can do, show with this hand, with pataka hasta. Same with tripata, same with ardha pataka, like I showed you. This is man and it kind of looks like that. <laughs> and then this is a woman, this is them in union. So all these gestures can be used to convey so much meaning if the audience doesn't just understand the language that's being sung. And then, one more thing that um, is very typical in Odissi dance is all the different bhangis that you will see, which are the postures that you find in temple walls. So, this is Darpan. So you can see a woman, many of these, looking at herself in the mirror. This will be Alasa Kanya. Okay? Then, this is again Darpan putting some brooch on her hair. Then you see very often a woman with a parrot. Either like this or like this. Different birds. Because uh, they say like the beauty of a woman is also like the beauty of a bird. You know, they're very delicate. They're very chanchal. They're very attractive. They're very sweet. So hence you'll have like a lot of these different, different uh, sculptures that were taken from temples in Orissa and they were brought into our dance. Even this Bandhani sculpture. So many, many different things like that. Um, okay. In Odissi, we use mainly, we have a very rich literature to pick from for our music, for our items. So, in Orissa itself, they have Odia poems that are sung by medieval poets, that were written by medieval poets, which are very sweet in nature. And then you have the Shastrik Geet Govind, which is in Sanskrit. So there is a lot for us to choose from in terms of uh, our music. Um, so now I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of this dance style. Okay. We will begin with the Mangala Charan, which is the first item usually of an Odissi performance. Mangala Charan means auspicious beginning. So whenever, again, because this dance had rich, has come from Vedic rituals, whenever you approach, the first thing you do is you pray, even in India today, before you want to do anything, you do a puja. So the dancer enters the stage with flowers. The flowers are offered to Lord Jagannath, who is the presiding deity of Orissa. <laughs> After this, the dancer does what's called a Bhumi Pranam, which means before you stamp on the earth, you just take the permission of the earth and you pray to the earth. This is the Bhumi Pranam. After the Bhumi Pranam, there is a shlok, which can be on any god and goddess. They say Ishta Devta, so whichever is your favorite god or goddess. You can pray to them because that's the beginning of the dance performance. Uh, the shlok ends with a sabha pranam. That means a sal salutation to all the audience members, all the gods in all the different directions. And it ends with what we call a three khandi pranam. So to God, to the guru and to the audience. Okay. The shlok today that I'll be presenting is a Ganesh Vandana. 
So I'll just show you a few of the gestures so you understand what you're going to say. So it says, I bow to you. Vigna Raja. So this is Ganesh, his trunk and the modak, remover of obstacles. You, who are seated under the kalpa tree. This is a wish fulfilling kalpa tree. Underneath this, you reside. Uma Putram. You're the son of Uma. Maha Kayam with a huge body. Dantinam and a long trunk. Ritya Go Vidam. And since you're the son of Shiva, you love to dance just like him. So the shloka is slightly longer. It says Tandava, that's Shiva, Priya Putraya, the dear son of Shiva, Tandava Rupini. So you saw the Shiva pose with the snake. There are many Ganesh poses also with him holding a snake. So the snake symbolizes the ego, basically that he's conquered his ego. Then Namo, I bow to you, Chintamani, pure, Shuddha, pure, Buddhi, consciousness, please give it to me, okay? So this, I'm just going to demonstrate this much. Thank you. Take a thing, you die. 
It's meant to be very soft, devotional. That's the opening item of Odyssey dance. Everything in Indian philosophy is supposed to start very gently, very spiritually. Now we move on to the next item. <coughs> so when Odyssey was being reconstructed, I spoke about all those sculptures that caught the imagination of all the dance gurus. So if you remember when I showed you Konarak, the Konarak temple is a architectural marvel. If you ever get the opportunity, you definitely must go and see it. It's one of the wonders of the world. The main sanctum of the temple collapsed. Nobody knows when it collapsed, but there were tons and tons of uh, sculptures and stones. In those days, 12, 30, in the 12th century that were taken, brought by the river and put one on top of the other. And nobody knows without any machinery how it was done. So since in the, I am sure you see it today also, when they are temple processions, like, okay, the Hare Rama, Hare Krishna people, right? When they go out on a procession, what are they always doing? They're singing and they're playing musical instruments. So in the old days, when there was a temple procession, that means the deity was taken out of the temple and around the town. It was a long procession of musicians, dancers, acrobats, pundits, everyone was there. So if you see the Konarak temple, on the top part of the temple, there are musicians who are females playing different musical instruments. And in the old days, 
the orchestra at the temple and at many places were always female. That's why till today in the south, you'll see all women are taught violin when they are young. They're taught music, they're taught violin, they're even taught percussion. So you'll see, uh, so basically when the dance was being reconstructed, the gurus saw these sculptures of musicians and they said, why don't we make a dance which has all these sculptures of different musicians. So that has been called Battu Nritya. So it starts off with a woman, female musician playing the veena. It moves to the musician playing the flute. Then it moves to the musician playing the uh, rhythm, the mardala. After the mardala, it shows the symbols, the manjira. Okay, and finally comes the dancer in prana with her hands in prana. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of battu, so you can see uh, how these sculptures were brought into the dance. different music instruments and then it ends with the this is just one fourth of the item or less um, <coughs> but then it goes into the dancer who's comes doing pranam to all the sides here here and then she takes different poses okay <coughs> so if you see a dance performance next time uh, classical just notice one instrument at a time will start the performance. So in Odyssey, <coughs> sometimes 
we'll have the sitar starting. Then the flute. Last will be the percussion, the heavier instrument. It starts with the lightest, then a little more emotionally heavy, and then an actual percussion, which adds rhythm. So the same way they have shown first the veena, then the flute, then the manjira, which is a rhythm instrument, and then the pakhavaj. So that's Batu. Now, I'll move on to the next item of Odyssey dance, which is uh, a little similar to Batu, but it is uh, very different also. It's pure dance. That means there's no uh, story in it. There is a particular raga taken. It's called a Pallavi. Pallavi means to blossom, to flower. So if you go for a Hindustani concert, you will see when the starter, when the dancer begins the rag, she'll start in alap, very slow. She may even hum a little bit and then she'll start in alap and she will build it up slowly, slowly, slowly. The raga will unfold. So you can experience the entire depth and beauty of the raga and the variations. A Pallavi is exactly like that, except we are doing it in dance. So there is, each Pallavi is set to a different raga. So it begins with very slow movements of the neck. Then you'll see the torso. Then you'll see the feet and then the whole body. So the way the raga unfolds, we try and translate that into a dance. So that's what a Pallavi is, okay? And then it builds up, it climaxes, it builds up in speed. A Pallavi has an antara and a sthai. So the sthai is where the same music is repeated and the antara are sections where the music changes. And this keeps getting more and more complex and it keeps getting faster and it builds up into a crescendo. It's a pure dance item. So now I'll show you a little bit of Mohana Pallavi. It's set to Rag Mohana. The first three items that I showed you were all three choreographed by Guru Kelujaran Mahapatra and the music uh, was composed by Pandit Bhubaneshwar Mishra. Ta 
So we have a limited time. So I could not show you the whole Pallavi, but basically it gets faster, it gets more complex. Um, <coughs> now we move on to the more uh, dance. Like anything else, it's like how you eat a meal. You'll have an aperitif, then you'll have a starter, then salad, then you'll have your main course. So you have to prepare yourself for the main course, right? You don't straight away eat the main course if you want to go out for a nice dinner that appeals to every sense of yours. So the same way the dance starts off connecting with the universal, spiritual, then it goes to the complete physical, abstract. That's just pure dance, sensory. And then it moves to this part, which is called the Abhinaya, which means a story. So in the Abhinaya, uh, there are so many mythological stories that are portrayed with different, different characters. The Abhinaya I'm going to present today is an Odia song. It's called a Champu. And Champu was a certain, it was there in Sanskrit as well, it is there. It's a style of writing where uh, you use the same alphabet for every line of the poem. So it'll be a champu, a champu, ka, ka. So each line will begin with ka, 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 ka. Okay, the ch this particular champu was composed by a medieval poet. This was when Vaishnavism was at its height in Orissa. And uh, everyone felt in the character of Radha and they were completely devoted to Krishna. So it is composed by Kavi Sur Baladevaratha and it's a Kha cham, Champu. It says Kharapa Tu Helure, you have become ruined. So it is a story, it's a dialogue actually. He's written 36 Champus for the 36 Odia alphabets. Each poem is a dialogue between Radha, Krishna and Lalita. Lalita is the Sakhi. So Lalita plays a very interesting role. Sometimes she's encouraging them to be together. Sometimes she's discouraging them to be together. She's constantly wavering. And it's almost like she's their bridge, but she's also constantly keeping them apart. So it's almost like a test of their love. Radha has just been to the banks of the Yamuna and she has seen Krishna for the first time. And she's absolutely besotted. She's intoxicated. She comes back and she tells Lalita, I have seen the most beautiful vision of my life. And Lalita looks at her because she's like a blushing, giggly girl. And she says, I've seen the most beautiful vision of my life. I don't care anymore for social customs or Riti Rivaz or anything. You get me to meet him. I know that you know him and anyhow you have to get me to meet him. So Lalita just listens very patiently and while she's listening to Radha, there are all these feelings entering her body. First of all, she's shocked. She's like, you're a married woman. This man is much younger than you. He's a flirt. You're married and you're contemplating having an affair with him and you want me to help you. Are you out of your mind? So uh, Lalita is like angry. At the same time, Lalita also knows that Krishna is not a normal person. She knows that he's got a very divine, special energy. So she's angry with Radha that you're just a normal person and you're thinking of being with him. She experiences shock, anger, She's afraid for Radha. At the same time, she feels uh, pity to Radha because she, at the end of it, she empathizes with her because she understands how much Radha is pining for him and she understands that the feeling that she's having for him is not a normal feeling. It's much more than what is uh, seen. It's not a normal human feeling. So she, uh, at the end of it, she sympathizes with her. But in the meanwhile, she goes through all these emotions are churning inside Lalita when she's listening to Radha. After L Radha finishes, 
Lalila, Lal Lalita replies to her and she says, you are ruined. Dear Radha, don't fool me <coughs> with innocent eyes like a little bird. Radha is making all these very, you know, like innocent eyes. Your audacity shocks me. You, like a little dwarf, are aiming for the celestial flower. Why do you want to sow plants of sadness in your own heart? What intoxicant have you eaten that you have lost all your senses in this game of love? You are no snake charmer to entice the darkest of them all, Krishna. Dear Radha, you are ruined. This bed of love is the merciless edge of a sword. Dear Radha. And the poet, um, in every poem, you will see that the poet is dedicating the poem to his patron. So the poet says in this poem that the Lord of the eight forts, this is the Lord of the eight forts, to his feet I prostrate. Then the Lalita says, the thief has arrived. You have willingly given all, even your body and your soul. Indeed, you are ruined, Radha. So, <laughs> so I'm going to now show you Karapa to Hilure. Kharapo tu helure, kharapo tu helure, khela lo la khanja na ki khela lo la khanja na ki ki sa hoso kholure. Tu korapo, tu helure, khela lo la khanja na ki ki sa hoso kholure, korapo, tu helure, korapo, tu helure, korbo. Hoi sura taru kharva hoi sura taru Koso mama chilu re kharva hoi sura taru Koso mama chilu re khedha bija nija rudha khedha Bija nija prudha ke dhare Binchi lure khara po Tuhe lure khara po Tuhe lure khiya lo Pari ke dhana khiya lo Pari ke dhana Monore vali lure, khali ka rano hi kona na gaku chali lure khora po. 
तुहे लोरे खराप तुहे लोरे खाई दे कि अचेता हो Most of the Odyssey performance, we end with an item called moksha, which is again a pure dance. And the way uh, we start with a shloka to a god or goddess, the moksha is a pure dance which ends with a shloka to the goddess Narayani. Um, and again, the dancer salutes all the four corners. But this is the end of my uh, lecture demonstration. Um, so one thing that uh, we were thinking of is, if anyone would like to give me a scenario and I will try and show it to you in dance. Monsoons have hit and there's flood everywhere. Okay, fine. So, do we want flood or we want normal rain? Okay. Normal rain? With, okay, okay, so we'll do? Fog. Okay, fog will maybe like night. So, Nagin dance. Hmm. Should I show you Krishna beating a snake? Okay. Fine. That's the snake's tail that he's picked up. Uh, Nagin dance usually we just kind of show different postures for snakes. We we've not like done uh, in our choreography, but there is one guru called Deva Prasad da, uh, Das who has choreographed a Shiva song. So when Shiva's dancing, the snake is on his shoulder, and uh, even we show Shiva wrapped up in snakes all over his body. So that's basically how we show. Yeah, that I showed. That is a snake charmer. So she tells her that uh, you're no snake charmer who can try and even touch the darkest of all the snakes, Krishna. So don't let your ego fool you that you can even get close to him because 
you will be poisoned. You means your ego again. <laughs> so, uh, anything else? Questions, if you have any? Like yeah. 50 and then it goes on to 100 and all that. So basically all Kathak. That in Odyssey? So I'll explain to you. Kathak was a dance that was born in the Mughal courts. So basically the dancers who were trained in classical dance had, like I told you, not all of them went into prostitution, but a lot of them became entertainers in the Mughal courts. And the Mughal courts were not religious at that time. So it, the dance was secular. There was no... Uh, Radha Krishna has come into Kathak later. They did not like this torso movement, any hip movement, because it was sensual. What was originally means where the Mughals came from, the style of dancing was very erect and it was mastery of something, footwork, basically. Um, so you will see like even uh, like Mus Muslim architecture, Islam architecture, there is a lot of detailed scroll work. But they won't be figures. They won't be men, women. It's considered the sensuous distracts you. So you have to focus. And that's the reason why they didn't have uh, all the hip movement, neck movement, torso movement in which was there in the indigenous styles of dance before the Mughals came. So what they wanted was an erect dancer who masters rhythm. That was the focus. If you want to master rhythm, you, you can't be mastering rhythm with your feet apart. You need to focus and concentrate here. And for to enhance the sound, they used to build up their ghungrus, 50, 100. If your footwork is crisp, you may have 100 bells on your feet, but the sound will be one. So that was the whole uh, way in which Kathak had grown. Each style, depending on who the patrons were, depending on the local language, depending on the local nuances, whatever was there, the local culture developed in a particular way. And hence Kathak had developed in this style. Thank you so much. Thank you.